computer. So welcome back to the podcast this week. I have got one of our senior leader facilitators on board. He is in sunny Queensland. He's not mentioned the weather once. He's mentioned it twice. It's a lovely 28 degrees there today. It's uh, actually only two degrees here in the UK at the moment, so no difference at all. I have still got shorts on. It is the lovely Steve Laurie. How are you? Good, Jack. Yourself? I am well. I'm well. How are you this morning? Yeah, very well, very well. Um, I'm, what Weather, what's that? I don't know anything about weather. It's 28 degrees here every day. Yeah, yeah. 20, no, don't, don't rub it in, Steve. Don't rub it in. <laughs> it's... <laughs> oh, God, I remember that. It was fantastic waking up to that every day. But, um, yeah, if it you can send... It's a very lovely part of the world. It's a very lovely part of the world. How's, how's your week kicked yeah. off? Apart from 28 degrees, how's your week kicked off? Yeah, busy week, busy week. It's always busy. There's a lot of things I'm trying to do across and um, uh, probably one of my latest challenges is that I've uh, been recently approached actually for the world titles in the Yacht Club. So that's, uh, that's probably been keeping me busy along with uh, a lot of client work and the like. So uh, yeah, it's been a pretty fun week. <laughs> Getting the, the, the Yacht Club. I, I do love, I, I, well, I, I would love to say I can sail a yacht but i can't um i can get in a tinny butt and go for a little fish do like that um hey, when you come down to queensland and visit us you'll be i'll be very happy to take you out and uh show you show you the ropes literally and uh and uh see how we can go and enjoy the actual beautiful morton bay oh yes get like right, let's get that booked in the calendar right now i want i think i'm over in september anyway so we can uh definitely go out for a little sail and get a uh, i would say but we will get a couple of tinnies and uh, enjoy it, but not obviously. Um, we'll, we'll be responsible because you there is still a limit on alcohol while sailing, likewise to driving. So, we won't make sure we'll make sure that we're very responsible on that trip. But, Steve, never, never been pulled over for, for uh, in the middle of a race while we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll drinking, right? So, there's a hint for you. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would actually, <laughs> I would love to see uh, an RBT try that to be honest. That would be absolutely <laughs> comical gold. Um, but for, for anyone that doesn't know you, Steve, obviously you've worked in some interesting companies, obviously a couple for, from over the UK um, that, that might be familiar. Obviously, Flight Centre was one um, a few years ago. They've maybe not got as much as a presence now in the UK, but, but certainly probably about 10 years ago, they were massive um, in the UK. Um, others, you've worked in Suncorp in Australia as well, which uh, has a bit of a global um, attrition to it. What is obviously your background and where where have you sort of started off? Where's your sort of middle path and where are you now, I guess? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really interesting is that um, you know, obviously I've, I've uh, currently found myself in lots of leadership positions and uh, lots of working with sea levels and boards and the likes uh, in the, over uh, the most second half of my career, I, I suppose, but uh, where I started off is, is uh, I was never actually seeking leadership, but um, when I was actually a, a, a kid and had a group of friends around me and stuff like that, um, I tend, just tended to find that uh, I'd end up being the one which was organising activities and sorting out squabbles and that type of thing. Yeah. And um, I was probably also the person which uh, got the group into trouble. All right. Whatnot. Yeah. Anything that we can, um, anything we can talk about, Steve, or will we keep no. that off record? Yeah, keep that off no, record. Okay, definitely, yeah. definitely not. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it was also probably uh, the person which uh, which helped the group to get out of trouble. Yeah, well, that that, that so, is the one person that you need in that situation. Absolutely. So thinking on the feet, uh, being able to deal with all kinds of different situations and that type of thing, and uh, probably definitely a bit of a trait of rebelliousness about yeah. I think when I was a younger person and um, I suppose uh, when you talk about the leadership side of things the uh, the daring to be a little bit different and to be able to take risks uh, let's say measured risks in yeah. in, uh, in modern terminology we probably didn't know what we were doing at that particular time so much um, and also you know not backing down easily and the like so some of the, the I suppose I was developing some of the leadership strengths that you need when you start to go out, go out into the real world and go into organisations and start to encounter... Uh, uh, All sorts of lovely, different experience. people. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
you know, I kind of like a, equate this also. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a keen gardener as well. And some of my inspirational people have been gardeners, including one of those being uh, Dame Elizabeth Murdoch. And she has an absolutely magnificent garden down in Melbourne called Cruden Farm. And a few years ago, I was uh, very, very privileged to be able to go there and uh, have a bit of a chat to her and uh, see her see her, her, her farm and the likes, and talk to her a little bit about uh, her son, which most of your listeners might be familiar with, called Rupert Murdoch. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, think every, I think everyone knows who he is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the interesting thing that she was talking about with, with him is that, uh, is that they had a granny flat at the back of Cruden Farm. Okay? Mm. And... Rupert wasn't allowed to stay in the actual house. He he actually ended up uh, staying in the granny flat out the back. And oh, so did he? He, Yeah, he did. So that's where he actually grew up uh, that way. And I think uh, through doing that, you, you get to uh, learn your independence and, uh, you know, again, taking accountability for, for your decisions and the likes and uh, you know, uh, looking after the place. So I, my, I myself, when... Uh, when I was growing up, when I was about 15, my, my parents used to go away. They used to, so I was down in Geelong, I was born in Bretton, Geelong. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, that always uh, is, brings football to most people's minds when you're in Australia. Yes, I'm a mad keen Geelong fan. The, um, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, so they used to go away to Queensland for about three months a year. So I got to run the house from about age 15 and, and you know, look after all the bills and, and do all the washing and ironing and, and uh, you know, feed myself with all that kind of stuff and hold a few parties. Sorry, mum and dad. Um, yeah, <laughs> you probably yeah, don't know about those yeah. as well. And then fix all the things that are broken. So uh, so from that side of things, just that, that uh, growing that independence, I think it was always a, a pretty important passage of, of right, if you like, to becoming a leader in the future as well. So, yeah. Uh, didn't, I didn't know about Rupert Murdoch sleeping in the granny flat. That's, that's yeah. really interesting. I wonder if yeah. that's how, where he built his empire in that one little gla- granny flat and went, mm, this is what I'm going to do with my life. But you never know. But I think you're right, though. I think that sort of sense of independence. And I think when you do first live on your own and you have to make those decisions of, right, well, I need to do this, this and this. And, you know, all that needs paid. Or Do you know what I mean? And just keeping the house tidy is such a a key sort of learning block, well, a learning block, I would say. Um, and just even what time do you get up in the morning? Stuff like, do you know what I mean? Just silly things like that yeah. where, you know, it's it's up to you to set your day right, I guess. But it's a, I think it's really important also is that uh, when, you, when you're meeting people and working with people, to understand a little bit, as you're doing with me now, it's understanding a little bit of their, their background, their history, is because it's from that background history you really get to understand what people's... Uh, uh, where their passions come from, where their drivers are. Yeah. And they, in, in that kind of circumstance, that's where you start to really build a relationship with people and understand you know, uh, how far you can, you can actually push people, uh, uh, what's going to be in, uh, an incentive to people to, to work for. Because everyone has their dreams and everyone wants to achieve their dreams. They're not all the same as what yours are. But it's yeah. a matter of actually uh, working with, with, with people who they are and where they want to go in, in the actual future. And if you can actually be a stepping stone for them and it actually then achieves what you want as an outcome for yourself and for your business then everybody's happy everybody's yeah. happy it's a, it's a true win-win situation yeah i think you're right with, with drivers and stuff like that and just to sort of look back a little bit to what what you said there is like everyone has obviously their different upbringing and different you know you, you're a keen gardener for instance if i would and to use aussie terminology if i was to go and get a backyard I could think of nothing worse than plants, trees. I would just love a concrete pool, some outdoor decking, and that would be me because I, I just can't. That that's not my thing. That doesn't get me excited. Maybe isn't the right word, but that contrast, obviously, between like what you said, everyone's got their different drivers. Everyone's got their different motivators. Mine's definitely isn't uh, gardening purely because i've not got the patience um which maybe and, and again that comes down to leadership as well um and the types of leadership you get um but i think with, with gardening you need that bit of patience my mum's got it 100 percent. she loves it and we'll we'll do it for hours upon hours where i would like nothing more nothing better than just 
a deck in, so a lounge and a pool. You know, and it, it sounds really, that sounds really bland and boring. But I think everyone's no, got I, their... I don't understand that at all, Jack, because it's just not me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, 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 have a lot of, I have a lot of trouble stopping, um, to tell you the truth. So I tried tried retiring when I got to 50 and it didn't work. So... Um, yeah, I know. That's, yeah. How I, that's how I grabbed you to, to be our senior leader. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you nabbed me. Yeah, that's I na- nabbed you. And now, what, what, obviously, we, we've had a discussion um, b- before we, we started this podcast uh, this evening, your morning. Um, you, you've, uh, like you said, you, you were meant to be retired, but you've been looped back into it and are now 2IC for a, a company. What's, what's happening there? Uh, yeah, so uh, I've got headhunted. Uh, they offered me a ridiculous amount of money um, to actually come in and help out. Uh, so I decided to pop out of retirement to to assist there. Uh, and basically doing what I've been doing now for many years, which is going in and uh, working with organisations, usually at the sea level uh, yep. within those organisations, sometimes with boards in those organisations, and uh, basically transferring, transforming the organisation to make it a more successful and more streamlined and well-run business at the end of the day. Uh, and a lot of that uh, is going through and uh, looking at what their actual businesses are. I work a lot in the actual professional services type of businesses in mm-hmm. particular, but all kinds of different other businesses as well. And that's based again on my, on my background because I did spend about 30 years actually doing professional services, delivery, lots of programs and projects and that type of thing. Uh, as well as training people and, and the likes along the way. But uh, for example, when I do actually go into businesses, I'd like to start to work with them and, and actually say, okay, what's your noble purpose? What is the yep. noble purpose of your particular business? Uh, if they can't actually define that, then that's usually a very good starting point for, for us for me to uh, talk about, okay, so why are you in business for? Have you actually thought about that? You know, are you just, did you actually accidentally end up in the business or... You know, what is what is the difference that you are going to make to your customers? What is the difference that you're going to make to the actual world? And in particular, that's that's really important as the world evolves because uh, the, the new generation coming through does want a noble purpose. They do actually want to know why they why they are making a difference to the world, why they are making a difference to the, the customer. And mm-hmm. if you can look into that, that's a very very powerful message. And it's also very powerful and clear for the messaging back to anyone which is going to engage with your, your, your business, whether people are looking to acquire your business or whether you're looking to acquire other people as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's good. the noble purpose is really, in the summary, it's a glue that holds the company together. It's a shared purpose that, that everyone can understand and to run with. Yeah. Well, I'm, that, that's one of the things that, well, we discussed it briefly about customer experience and, and why I'm so keen for it. I mean, we've, we've had a couple of setbacks, you know, which any company I think does, but I think you need to obviously, like you like what we said, you know, it's how you react to them and what you want to do, and and how you want to commit to how you deliver. I guess a, for me, a good customer experience. Um, another thing is the the values which I'm in the process of setting up, which I think is something now that a lot of businesses are really adhere to, and I think not just for me, but how I want the business to run mm-hmm. and deliver content you know over the next 5 10 15 20 however many years i'm involved um because i think it's so so crucial now that everyone is on that like you said that shared purpose and on that sort of goal to go this is why you're here and this is why you're so in, in or you're so integral to the plan you know that if you if you don't understand that you don't understand what's happening everything else is going to fall down and i'll only for for any business, it's going to harm the customer at the end of the day, regardless of if you're in an engineering firm or if you're McDonald's, for instance. Do you know what I mean? If no one really knows yeah, yeah. why they're there, it's going to prove a little bit difficult long term. And especially, and especially when you're talking about in the senior leadership uh, aspects, you're talking about like no real purpose. Well, what, that actually provides a framework that you can start to make decisions yeah. about it as well. So every every decision should be supported supported by the actual noble purpose of your organisation. So uh, you mentioned flight centre before. Do you know what their what their noble purpose is? Do you know what their actual purpose statement is? I, I I don't know, but I think I've maybe seen it. 
I think I've maybe seen something on this in the past, but if you could elaborate, that'd be. Yeah, that's cool. And and Screw Turner, because I've had lots of conversations with Screw Turner, Screw Graham Turner, who's the CEO. Um, yeah. Founder. So theirs is to open up the world for those who want to see. Yeah. It's, it, well, yeah, I guess that was definitely what they've done. Because yeah, absolutely. They're, they're, they're still big in Australia. I know they've got a few in the UK. They had one in Edinburgh. They might still have one, um, but they did have a few. But um, I've flown, I've done a couple of bookings whilst I was in Australia with the flight centre and mm-hmm. can I actually never fault them. I've, I've done one booking myself and it was an absolute nightmare. So that's why I, I reverted back to type and got the old travel agent to do it for me, even though I was one, which probably doesn't give myself very much justice when the poor people are sent on holiday. Hopefully it sent them to the right country. But um, yeah, Flight Centre was massive. I tried to, I applied there numerous times, got kicked back every time. Maybe it was because I didn't maybe pass their, uh, you know, which country is this, Spain or Italy? And I just, oh, it might be Italy. Benidorm, oh. yeah, that's definitely Italy, isn't it? But um, try, yeah. Try being in Australia, it's a little bit, little bit further away to get to those places. Well, yeah, yeah, it takes takes two days, doesn't it, Steve? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I've, right. I've, I've but, done uh, the Screw start up the organisation, there's a bus tour operator over in the UK. And then um, interesting is that uh, four or five years ago, he actually bought, he sold out of that, but uh, he bought back that bus company. I don't think it was bought because of profitability, I think it was because of nostalgia. Oh, do you think? <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, yeah. It's a spare change. Yeah, it's, so, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I wouldn't mind to be in that, that spare change situation, to be honest with you. The, the best one I actually know of is um, with Cochlear is uh, uh, we help people to hear and to be heard. So cochlear, say that, so say that again. So cochlear, is a, so cochlear is a bionic ear implant uh, company. Yeah. So people which which just cannot hear at all, actually, it's got a um it's a, a probe that goes down into the actual cochlea of the bone inside your ear. Yeah. And that allows people to be able to receive the vibrations and translates it straight into the brain instead of going by your ears. So it allows deaf people to hear. Right. So their purpose is we help people to hear and to be heard. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's, it's yeah, fantastic. It's, it's, it's the implant that's just outside, isn't it? That's on right. the, yeah, on the side, yeah. yeah. And, and I know because because uh, I know people with cochlear implants and the likes, that uh, deafness is a profoundly uh, disabling uh, condition. So the fact, the fact that they're saying not just to be able to hear, but to be heard, to be able to hold conversations with people, that's really profound. You know, it gives me goose people when you, when you talk about that one there. Yeah. And anyone which is involved in the company, I'm sure it's the same. Yeah. Yeah, they know exactly what they're working towards as well. And like you said, get that sort of purpose for, for everyone, yeah. um, especially up at the top, which I think is is crucial. Now, obviously, we're going to touch on to a couple of different things in this one, right? And a, cu- a couple of these, um, obviously, I know you, you've worked mostly on the, the, the C-suite. Now, to give you a bit of insight, um, I've, I've seen some decisions in C-suite that I look at and go, because I was in between, you know, I was in senior management, but I wasn't, I was by no means ready to step up to that sort of stage. Mm. And you look at it and go, that you, you made the wrong decision here. Because obviously, if anything's made at a C-suite level, that gets disseminated down. And it's a bit like Chinese whispers at times, I feel, in, in organisations that maybe don't have the structure that, you know, let you go in and help and support. Mm. Because then one thing says another and another person says it and a little bit of a different interpretation and then it can just become well actually that's not what was said but what would you say has been a a real sort of strength that you've seen or, or a powerful leader or maybe not powerful that's maybe not the right word but a really good leader that's shown really good leadership at maybe a critical time where everyone needed especially c-suite where it's really, really key for someone to hold their own, I would say. When have you seen that has been like, yeah, that was fantastic. So holding holding your own is actually interesting because uh, especially when we're talking about uh, working back within their organisations, it's not a matter of holding their own. It's more about the... How do you actually going back to the copy? I think how do you actually get heard? Yeah, in your organisation, it's a bit like you were, you were saying there before. Is that um, is that uh, 
how, as a C suite uh, person, do you get your message out to the people that you're working with for rest of your organisation so that they can understand that they can be on the same page as what you are and then, as a result, be incentivized and to actually put in place the programs that you uh, are really asking them to do. Yeah. 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 So, so what we're talking about here at the end of the day is communication. Yeah. And what is the right way of actually setting up the communication? Um, but before the communication comes the aspiration. Yeah. So, yeah. Then look at it that way. Yeah. So, uh, so when you're talking about leadership, the C level, it's all not just so. Okay, so we now have a purpose. There's a couple of things that I fix behind the actual per- purpose itself, which is the values. So, what are we as an organisation? What is our group within the organisation? What are our values that we want? What are we? What are our values? What are? What are? What is? What is? the thing which is the non-negotiables, which are key to how we're going to behave and how we're going to treat our customers and ourselves within our group, within our organisation. Yeah. So we talk about the the purpose. I look at the values there. Um, You'll tend to put a, a charter behind that to say, you know, in addition to those values, what are we then good at? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do we actually go about doing that? If you get those building blocks in place, then you've got the, the, the start of how you can actually communicate with your people at the end mm-hmm. of the day. So you and look get, way through it. And, and get it out there. Yeah. And I think the values are, are, are super important to make sure they're known and understood. Because like all management, the test of management isn't what people are doing when you're looking over their shoulder. The test of management is... What are people doing when you're not looking over their shoulder? And if I can, you know, in particular, as a C, as a C-suite, you want to be able to step away. You might have a, you might have be focusing on an acquisition of lots. So you need to actually focus, have the ability to step away from your business, and to allow the business to still operate and for the initiatives that you started to to continue and to be put in place mm-hmm. without you being there for for periods of time. Yeah, so that's your job. That's your job is to set the set the strategy set the direction and then allow people to enact that going forward. Yeah, just and sort of enable that trust in, in the team to just get the job done or the task done or the project done without you, like you said, having to look over the Same shoulder thing. and go, why is that not done? Why do you know what I mean? That that because I think we've all maybe had a manager like that at some point in our career. Probably yeah. early early on, I would say maybe. Maybe not actually in, in some cases that I know of, but <laughs> <clears throat> um but yeah just just on that right when i just want to go back to values because this is something that i've done in the past when when i've managed teams is i've got them you know but we'll show the company for instance we'll show the company values whatever they may be it changes obviously in every company and a lot of companies maybe have similar or you know a, a lot of them are maybe on the same page but mean different because they do x y and z but one thing i always used to get the team to do and it sort of is, is what you're touching on there is get i would get them in a bit of paper now during covid and all that we couldn't do it we we're all working from home virtually but you know get something like a whiteboard on google sheets or something like that for them as a team to just look, go on and i'm going to go right i'm giving you an hour and a half here i'm going to go away i'm going for a meeting in an hour and a half, I want you to th- figure out what are your team values personally. I'm not here. You come back and in, in an hour and a half, we'll discuss it. And you can tell me what our team values are going to be moving forward. And I always used to get that done really early on, you know, mm-hmm. first, second week to implement a bit of a, not accountability. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm sales through and through. But for me, I used to be able to go, for instance, if someone was late, consecutively how does that impact the team not just you and your target or <coughs> pardon me Steve how does that impact you eh, or how does that not just impact you but impacts the wider team which then obviously mm-hmm. impacts me and then my wider team 
and it was really interesting because once they done it and you go right have you have you looked at your team values i never you know people are late people have issues that right sorry i was late this happened this happened whatever right i'm fairly not laid back is maybe not the right word but i'm human everyone's late everyone has an issue that's fine second time right i wouldn't even say anything i'd just say go and have a look at your values and come back to me in half an hour and they'd come back straight away and go jack i'm sorry i'm just like no you don't have to say sorry to me you have to say sorry to the team and then yeah. you wouldn't see that yeah. happen again ever and it was it was a really interesting thing that and i can't remember where i seen it i seen it and i don't know if it was a leadership book or something like that but i remember doing it i think it was actually i think it was a, a mike wingberg book i think i've brought them up previously where you you no sorry it wasn't it was a well for for oz it was a soccer manager <clears throat> who manages burnley sean deitch he got yeah. his team to write out the values of what they were. And I think he gave them a few months, obviously in corporate world, I don't, I, you know, you don't have that much time at times depending on contract length or whatever that may be. So you have to implement things pretty quickly. And I've done that and I've done it ever, ever since. And the impact you get from the team, because it's such a basic and it's such a small thing, but it makes a massive impact. Like, like you said, about just getting the job done. So yeah, I so I'm probably looking one level even above that. So um, I, I, uh, I definitely ascribe to that, and I definitely set up with the, the teams, and that's one of the things that I get my teams to actually set up. Uh, I call it something different, slightly different, because I'm got from I'm also a little bit from the agile world as well as I was uh, doing agile kind of work before agile was even invented. It's called cool. Right in those days, um, yeah. we, I, I refer to that as being a social contract where the, all the team sign off with each other about this, this is our way we're going to work, this is uh, our behaviours are going to go off and that works. Um, yeah. With yeah. the with the values, it's a deeper thinking uh, behind that, and probably the one of the one of your previous uh, guests uh, said that he had a crush on Brene Brown and her, her dare to lead. Uh, 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 books less training there. I, I think I've got a similar crush on Brene because she's quite inspirational in the way she actually goes through and, and allows people to, uh, teaches people to be able to, what she calls, rumble with vulnerability. So it's able to reach into people's personalities and, and getting people to be vulnerable. Um, uh, she's very big on the actual value side of things, on trust and the resiliency, which she calls learning to rise. Um, all these are very, very important traits, especially uh, as you get up through the ranks in management, those particular areas in particular, they become more common yeah. and more difficult. But one of the best things I actually did, and I'll, I'll let you into a little secret here, I'm not a big person for putting inspirational words around the office. You know, some people put up, you know, motivational terms. Yeah, stuff, yeah. I've only got one thing which is stuck up around the office. And that is uh, from my analysis of myself, from Brene Brown, on what my values are, what my personal values are. Yeah. And this is a very, very powerful experience. I do recommend that people do it for themselves. They do it for businesses. And, and that's why I, I do this in businesses. I've done it at the Yacht Club, which I'm sure we'll probably talk about later. Um, uh, and basically the secret here is people have lots of different values. But the hard part is to distill them back and bring them back to just two. Yeah. 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 What, are your, what are your two values? What are the two core values that drive everything else that you do? And the important thing about values is, is, is this, is that you won't change your values. You can't change people's values. They are what they are. And so yeah. it's a matter of understanding and appreciating what people's values are. The same with the organisation. What are your organisation values and sticking to them because you're not going to move those. And it's also a good litmus test to say, once we understand what they are, if your values aren't aligned with those of the organisation, then maybe you're not working at the right organisation. Yeah. Maybe there's somewhere else that is going to fit your values and it's going to be less stress on you if you go and work for another organisation, which is better aligned to your values. Yeah. No, no. I, do you know what? I 100% agree with that. I remember... Um watching 
uh, and I've mentioned this previously, a Gary Vee video. And I remember he said something, and it was at a time where I just recently came back from Australia, actually, and went through, I went through the entire interview process. Um, this was before the business was set up um, via Zoom or, or something similar at the time. Um, and phone calls and stuff like that. And I think it was a four or five stage interview process. Got to Edinburgh, I think three days later, I was in another interview with them, probably not fully recovered from jet lag and things like that. And you got the role and you were given a spiel. And I thought, right, fine, you know, let's just give it a bash. And probably by about week three or four, I sat there and go, nah, this isn't for me. And I think it takes a lot, like it takes yourself because I think a lot of people go, well, it's, it's a job, I need to get into it. And I'm very much, if right, if this isn't going to help me, or for, for me, mentally, or, you know, you just know, I'm, I'm not giving you anything, you're not giving me anything. This is a time to, for us to part now. And you'd rather rip that Band-Aid off quickly yeah. and fast than let that sort of scar just peel over because at some point you're going to graze it again and the wound's just going to explode. Um, but yeah, I, I completely agree. I think I've, and I've worked with people who maybe didn't probably understand the values of certain organisations and you could just see how, how miserable they were, you know, and, and I'm not saying that, by the way, that it was all the values because that's not always the case. You know, there, there's other ways that maybe they can be unhappy, but the, just the job wasn't for them. Pure and and the, problem there, the problem there is if, if they're unhappy, then it's quite likely that the people which are surrounding them won't be happy as well in that organisation. So, so I'll just touch on, on this part because I, I didn't mention it before. So part of, part of my retirement is, is that uh, uh, the, the, the club which I've been part of, the, the yacht club I've been part of the last 10 years or so, approached me and asked me to take on the role of Commodore, which is the, uh, the CEO if you like, for people which aren't in the sailing fraternity of the uh, of the club, which was really lovely for them to do. And um, I, I felt that I could really uh, uh, make a big difference there uh, as far as the club is concerned. Yeah, and make an, um, make an impact, massive impact, because uh, with COVID and the likes, we, we did actually struggle quite a bit over that particular period. And we really needed to. So it was pretty much starting with a, a bare bones club and, and yeah. rebuilding it back up. Which is uh, taking about twelve months or so, but uh, but uh, we've uh, we've done that very successfully, and uh, we've now taken a lot more members than what we had previously. Uh, we're hosting the Saber State titles in a couple of weeks, and uh, we've been approached uh, last week as well to host the uh, the uh, the Mustang Skiff World titles as well. So it's a big turnaround for a little club in a very short amount of time. But uh, part of that is. Part of that is that uh, as my role of Commodore, anyone which wants to become a member of the club, I actually interview them personally. Yeah. And I take them back. And the first thing I sit down and say to them, okay, these are our two core values. We are a family-friendly club and we help each other. They're our two core values as far as the club is concerned. And again, yeah. you know, it, because I've been a member of a club, it only took me like three seconds to distill them back down. To, so I've been thinking about the values of a club for many years before that period of time. It yeah. can take years to come up with this. But the important thing is everyone which comes through the actual club, they get the same spiel. These are the values of a club. And you'll see that that'll either attract people or it will drive people away. So yeah. it attracts the right type of people as far as I'm concerned. And it drives the other people away, which aren't, aren't right. But because also by having a core set of values there, what that then allows me to have is the difficult conversations with people. Yeah. So I can I can pull people back and, and there was uh, one person which is a which is a long standing person with the club, um, uh, but their values didn't well align with our core values. So as a matter of I can then sit down with that person and say, these are the values at your club. Um, people have noticed that this is where you are listen, living up to some of these values. So like we still like you down the club. We love your contribution and likes. I think you're awesome and that type of thing, but we need you to align with the actual club's values. Can you actually do that? Yeah. Bringing them a bit of accountability back in as well. Absolutely. To, and to, and on, that, on that basis, they decided not to 
percent, and that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Obviously, we 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 like someone we would like to have a, have a club. Um, we now miss that person, but it was never going to work. Yeah, so it just takes a lot of that friction, a lot of that pain away from from, from both parties. It makes it makes life a bit easier for everyone involved, who's obviously helping try and yeah to support the club as well. Yeah, so the, the conversations you have and the likes and and uh, coming up with some of this stuff might be might be difficult, but uh, I don't lose sleep over it. Yeah, well, I guess if you got if you have got the values, and then I think that's the, the biggest thing where we were discussing sleep as well actually prior to this, um, which is is very uh, short um, supply, but it's, it's, you have to sometimes make hard decisions or difficult decisions or have difficult conversations and I think once you because I think people think these difficult when you're when you're in a senior management role that these conversations never really happen they probably happen more at more, times than, than what people think and sometimes more than what the good conversations happen because there's a lot of moving parts in any organization if that be small or global you're going to have to have difficult conversations. I, I was typically having them at one point um, during COVID on a daily basis, you know, whilst mm. working for an energy firm. That was horrible. But you, like you said, you can't lose sleep over it and you just need to crack on, I guess. Um, well, every, every decision you make is a compromised decision. So there's always trade-offs in the decisions you need to see make. Yeah. And you never you never making decisions based on full information. So you need to be comfortable with the decision that you actually made is the best decision you can make today. Now, some of those decisions will be we need to actually get more information before we can actually make the decision if the time frame allows for that. Uh, but I'm also a big believer in businesses at the you know, the business metrics being very key. So what decisions do we need to make? What metrics do we actually need to, to gather? To, or what, what measures do we, what metrics do we need? What KPIs do we have, which are going to assist with us making those decisions? Uh, where can we actually get the data for, from to be able to support that, to be able to calculate that KPI? And what processes do we need to put in place to make sure that the quality of that data that we're gathering is reliable so that the, we can rely yeah. on that to KPI that's been measured. And then that gives you the information and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff, obviously, that goes into making a decision. But, you know, driving businesses by proper uh, strategy, structure and metrics is key to business success. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Well, it's, it's in, that's the only thing I've ever sort of known to be honest because in sales everything is driven by metrics and and kpis and how right so you've got one in ten conversion so if you phone x amount more people a day you're going to get x amount result so i think from, from my point of view is and even from the business point of view you need to know what's happening and yeah i think um some i think you're right um i think sometimes like you said, sometimes you need to find out more information. Sometimes that decision has to be taken. And sometimes, like you said, you, you might not have the full picture at times, which sounds hard for people to maybe, if you've, if you've never been in that situation, or if you're listening to this and you've never been in that situation, the easiest way to describe it is if you're lost on a road, you either pick left or right, and one's going to be the right decision, and one's going to be the wrong decision. You know, that mm. is the way sometimes you have to make business decisions and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but i think like you said i would much prefer to have like what you said and to to use my analogy of lost on a road and you turn left or right you'd rather you had your map your compass your whistle your torch your gps all there to make that decision to go actually it's better going right but sometimes that's just not the case well if you don't and um you're at a crossroads there and you're going to damascus Maybe you look at the road and work out which one's been more frequently travelled. Yeah, or you could do that, Steve. Yeah, yeah. You've just torn apart my analogy there, but I completely understand <laughs> what you're meaning. <laughs> so, it's, it's, so, so it's not all. So it's not all just statistics and the likes. There is a lot of art in it as well. You know, even in the sales world, sometimes making more phone calls isn't the answer, even though it's no. the obvious answer. 
So it's about what do we got to do? How do we actually think? So it's not just not just the metrics; it's also uh, the, the the people uh, around you as well. Uh, how you've actually built up trust for those people, what I call putting lollies in the actual jar with those yeah. particular people, so that they will come to you, and and you're able to yeah you know, take a have an, an open and honest conversation with those people. Yeah, um, without them feeling threatened because you know the hardest thing to actually gather is is that. Uh, is the, uh, the empirical evidence from the people which are part of your team. Yeah, 100%. If you tell any sales leader, though, to just, if you said that, I could guarantee if we've got a room of 100 people and you said that to them, they'd say, no, no, if they just pick up the phone, they'll get more sales. Where I like, I, I look at it in a completely different, probably because I've had to to do so many different roles in, in the past few years. Yep, and, well, smarter, not harder. Yeah, yeah I, I just think it's just... Needs to be changed. Yeah, this what are the script, customers saying? Yeah, what are you the customers like saying? It's, it, that's yeah, one of the things. Like, what what is actually the feedback coming back? And you get the usual stuff from salespeople, but um, mm. th- you know, sometimes it's it's a training error. Sometimes it's actually you're you're not speaking to the right customer about the right thing. It, yeah. You know, it, right yeah, exactly. Is a data point of view. You know, what are you doing? What time are you calling them at? You know, I can't phone. Mm. I can't phone Australia at nine a.m. UK time. Otherwise, I'd have some really, pardon my French, pissed off people because if I'm phoning mm. directors and, you know, CFOs, CIOs at eight o'clock at night talking about a leadership event, I can tell you I would get 100 people that just told me to jog on, mate, like it's eight o'clock at night. But, um, yeah. yeah, you're right. It's all about gathering that evidence, making sure that there's a strategy behind it that makes sense for everyone. Um, yeah. Now, obviously, on the back of that then, <clears throat> What has maybe been a time where there maybe wasn't the strongest leadership, or or maybe, yeah, I, I never, I, I don't want to say worse, but you know, like the 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 time where it's like, mm, that wasn't fantastic, that wasn't very well thought out. Have you experienced a time where where you've seen that in a sort of C C suite senior management level? Yeah. Yeah, um, it's a, it's a it's a really good question, and uh, obviously I can't give too much detail to protect. I know, you need, like, yeah, yeah, you can't get. Yeah, we have to be diplomatic in these situations. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but probably uh, there is uh, there has been a situation uh, over my career, and um, and I suppose I'll, I'll talk about the personality a little bit rather than the situation because it's probably a little bit. Uh, less obvious <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> to, to things. But where you've got a personality type where um, where the C-suite thinks that they have all the answers. Mm. And so they just want to download to you. Without actually listening. Rather than actually listen to what you're actually saying. So the two-way conversation. And I've seen this happen on multiple occasions by, by C-suites. Mm-hmm. And especially like um, the best best C-suite people are the people which are able to have that 30 second lift conversation with the janitor and get some something meaningful out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 100%, was, uh, 100% agree with you on that. And I will, again, I will watch what I say, but I can probably go into a little bit more detail, but I, I will keep it very short and sweet. I've been in, numerous conversations with a couple of different C-suites, both so you're having to present back to them on a weekly basis about X, and I won't, I won't tell you what X is. And you'd sit there and the most ridiculous question would just go at you without even really listening to, to what was going on and they're telling you, well, this is what this means and this is what, and then you're having to politely and it's very hard for for someone like myself where I'm maybe sometimes a little bit too direct at times and go actually no that's not really the case this is what that means that's not what that actually means and this is what this means and it's so infuriating because it doesn't get you any further and again in that situation if you're not a C-suite you have to really watch what you say um, because it can't come across as patronising or demeaning to them. It's like sort of 
the only way I could describe it is being in the army, I guess. Do you know what I mean? That you, you can mm. never, if you're a, a rank below, you can never tell yeah, the, there's a rank above yeah. that they're an idiot in front of everyone. You have to sort of tell yeah. them behind closed doors or to the side going, actually, I think this is how you do it. And it's one of those situations where I think the more times you do it, the more tactful you get. But um, but do you, why, why, do you, why do you think they do that, though? Do you think it's a sense of insecurity or do you think it's a, they just want to know it all? That, that that's their type of personality what, what do you I think, think? They, they just think that they know all the answers like they they literally think that they know all the answers and and um uh, yeah they've been doing their job for a long time and that type of thing therefore uh they've done all the training and that type of thing um but we all know that uh, the, the the best ideas come from the people which are on the on the coal face and and uh, they're the ones which actually knows what's, what's really going on in a business. I do very much encourage C-suites to still walk the floor, you know, something yeah. that they probably did when they were working their way up through the ranks and being managers, but just walking walk the floor and have a bit of a conversation, let people know a little bit about themselves. Yeah. Um, because what that then does is makes, makes them more approachable. Yeah, 100%. Uh, makes them more approachable. So people... Are comfortable anyone in the business should be able to talk about the right things at the right level yeah. to to a c-suite if it's actually put correctly and in the right way because obviously um the other thing is that you're always time poor yeah so time, management of your time is just absolutely critical um the people which are successful in, in c-suite roles do manage their time really really well um and uh and so you need to be really respectful of that but it doesn't mean to say that you can't get your Get yourself heard you can't get the ideas across but it may be that you need to just put it into an, an email format or a presentation or something like that. something yeah. very quick point form very digestible very quick and if it's something which is a good idea then i'll come back to you and uh, dig into it a little bit further yeah Hun- yeah 100 percent. i think um yeah i can I, and i think we said this again before i can sometimes ramble <clears throat> and sometimes for me i just need to put in an email now that can be to myself just so I know, right, that, you know, this is what I need to go into this meeting and say. And I've done that numerous times, if that be written down, send an email, just to make sure that, right, this is what I need to cover, this is what I need to do, this is actually what I need to get out of this meeting. Because I think you, like you said, because sometimes you can just be back to back constantly, and it's a bit different now for myself, but, you know. Oh, yeah. But if you're um, walking the floor, then you can, yeah, you can stop them on the way past. Yeah, but it's it's your it's like you're literally a thirty second pitch. And when I'm, I've done a lot of um, coaching, mentoring of, of younger people as well, working their way up through management lines. And one of the first exercises I get them to do is to have the elevator conversation, literally in the elevator with as, as you're going up with people. Practice this. Um, you want to if, if someone says to you in the elevator, so what do you do? What's your answer? And you need you got uh, however many floors there are in your building be able to get that answer back out uh, and to get them to understand what it is that you actually do. It's a really yeah. good exercise for, for, for people doing. So that's the same thing with, you know, if you see what's coming around, looking for, doing the floor, how's it going? Um, you know, what's going on here, etc. cetera. Um, then, yeah, you do that 30 second pitch. You talk about uh, flights from the floor, Screw does that. Screw still walks the floor. Screw Turner. Yeah, I, th- I think, it, honestly, I think it's so, again, when you come down to approachability, it's sort of, I think, if, if the top level are doing it, because I think it's difficult if you're trying to do it in middle management and trying to implement new ideas that maybe, as an organisation, culture-wise, it's maybe not in, in place. But if the top are doing it, that travels down. It's like, you know, like yeah. good habits travel down and bad habits travel down. Um, and I think if they are doing it, it definitely makes a massive difference to the to the entire sort of business unit because again it comes back to again the values about what's the purpose what is everyone working towards and yeah. if you have that from the very top it makes life so much easier or in, in, in my opinion it does and it shows care for your people too that's, that's the other component of it and that is a massive massive thing i think that a lot of businesses i'm not saying businesses didn't do it previously but i think now with covid they've seen that maybe people's values have probably maybe changed you know, there, there'll be millions of people that were working 
you know, hundreds of hours a week. And they've said, actually, no, I want to spend time more, more with my family. And they've made that decision and they'll work around that to make sure that they're still doing their job to the best of their abilities, but they've got their limitations now. Um, and I think that comes down to, like we said, just caring for, for, for your people. And that does start from, like you said, if that be a 30 second conversation, because you don't know who you're going to meet on that floor, Lauren, do you? Do you know what I mean? Mm. If you are a C-suite, they might have an idea yeah. that you can go, actually, that's really good. I want to come back to that guy or that girl and get a bit more information on that. It's also teaching your your, uh, your people how to have an impromptu conversation as well. So being able to be approached about any topic at any time and to provide a, a lucid answer to it is is uh, good training for them as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in my younger days, I wasn't very good at that. But now, yes, Le- learning, <laughs> learning. But um, obviously, we, we, we've mentioned a, a couple of different things. Obviously, has, has there been anyone that has maybe influenced? Now, I know you didn't obviously aspire. You started at the start. You want you didn't want to, you know, it wasn't something that you went, right, I want to be a C level at 15. You know, you, you didn't go into that. But has there been anyone that you followed or looked at over your career or worked with that has maybe been a bit of an influence to you? It was interesting is that uh, I, I was doing IT things from uh, the age of 15, development stuff for people. Mm. So by the time I got to university, I already knew that I wanted to move into management. I moved into management at 23. So I've been doing that, that role for a long time. Um, uh, there's a, so where we look at... Uh, influences and, and I suppose external influences to the people that I've worked with because I've had plenty of inspirational uh, people along the way uh, and in particular I've uh, worked for a couple of Australia's greatest IT entrepreneurs and I've learned so much from, from, from them and having dinners with them and spending time with them. Um, uh, Lindsay Catamol, which is, which is the CEO of Aspect Computing, which is my first job at a university, she, she was able to, she, she listened so well but uh, I remember she could recall word for word conversations we'd had 10 years earlier. <laughs> stuff, stuff like that. It was just, it used to freak me out. It was just a photographic memory for that type of thing. Um, uh, I'm not an avid reader of books, but I do a fair bit of traveling. So I do a lot of audio books on tape, which I just get from the library. So it's nice and cheap. Yeah. But um, uh, author, author wise, I like uh, Peter S- S- nah, Fitzsimmons, uh, which he's known for rugby in Australia. But he's actually one of Australia's best authors. And uh, basically the types of books I like to, to, to read are autobiographies about yep. inspirational people and likes there. So there's one good one which he wrote on, on Mawson, which is an Australian explorer. So he's an Antarctic explorer. He, um, he uh, conquered Mount Erebus, found the South, uh, the South Pole, South Magnetic Pole and the likes, and just you know, talking about uh, uh, some of the ways that he was able to make decisions uh, his book there included all the Antarctic explorers and, and uh, Mawson was one of the explorers uh, as part of Scott's team. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. a great English explorer. And Scott, as everyone knows, ended up dying um, on the, one of his journeys back from the South Pole. But a couple of these decisions that he put in there about um, uh, uh, favouring ponies over dogs uh, and, being able, and when to turn back, even though he's within sight of the pole, should have been turning back and stuff like that. So yeah. Yeah, what are the decisions that we've made in there? Um, is another one of his books, which is uh, James Cook. So uh, Captain James Cook was uh, one yeah. of the most inspiration, inspirational people in history. A guy who's worked his way up from obscurity into, into being one of the, uh, you know, uh, when you talk about the navigation side of things, uh, took everything that was in navigation, learn all that, built on that, uh, became better at it. But his man management, so you, 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 you get a boat, which is a tiny little boat, shove a whole bunch of people on it and spend a couple of years at sea. You talk yeah, about yeah, like that, a, I wouldn't do it too well. <laughs> and uh, continuously learning um, how he actually changed it, how he actually approached new people on new lands. Uh, it was completely revolutionary in his time. Much, very much a calculated risk taker um, and uh, unbelievable planner. So if you look, so someone who was in a boat like myself, um, just the way that he actually went around this decision of choosing the bark as the type of ship that he's going to use as the endeavor when he was coming down to Tahiti and then ran to the Southern Ocean. 
even though it had only traveled at 4.5 knots. It was a very, very slow boat. So why do you actually choose that boat? Is because when you can, if you actually end up running onto a reef, which you're going to do when you're an explorer, as you did do, up in the Great Barrier Reef in Queensland here, mm. um, you got the best chance of actually surviving. So it's a shallow, it's a shallow, blunt nose kind of ship. So it'll just roll onto the actual reef without scraping the whole bottom off and making big holes in the actual boat. Right? Jeez, so, this, is way, this is way over my boat knowledge. I think. Um... Yeah, but like, is this the way you actually thought about? And the fact that you put lightning chains on the, on the ship so they didn't lose the mast to lightning, because it's hard to find wood in the middle of the ocean to replace yeah. your mast. And, this, yeah, yeah. And, and then obviously the whole thing about the, the sauerkraut and, and uh, making sure people had all the right diets so that they didn't get scurvy. So he had one of the highest record um, uh, uh, retention of people not dying from scurvy or other diseases. Very clean, everything was clean. If not, you got whipped, right? So that was, <laughs> yeah. Talk about the carrot and the stick, and the stick called the sauerkraut and the whip. So that's that's why you ran your ship. Very hard on, on making sure that people were doing the right thing. Yeah. So yeah, big values on, on getting there and, and making sure he's got there with his people. So yeah. It's, and yeah, then probably. It's... Sorry, Steve. I'll let you go. Sorry. And then probably the other one, which I like, is autobiographies. Um, John Howard. So John Howard's autobiography, and it's actually called Lazarus Lazarus Rising. And it's really Lazarus Rising is really uh, 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 a testament to John Howard's resilience. So John Howard, uh, probably for your English audience, is uh, is Australia's second longest serving prime minister, and he had uh, he had a lot of significant achievements during his time, such as the gun law reforms, Port Arthur Massacre, during the Port Arthur Massacre, introduction of the GST into Australia. And one of the things he's very passionate about, because he's, you talk about his values and his values is really about doing the right thing for Australia. And so he was actually, he showed excellent leadership traits through understanding what his values are, understanding mm-hmm. what, the, what the people, like so he, one of these big uh, catchphrases is that the people are always right. So when he went to an elect- election, it was always the people was right. And he lost plenty of elections before he started his long term. Yeah. Um, but he's saying the people are always right. So being in touch with that. And one of the other things, so he was in Washington during 9-11 and helped to influence um, George W. Bush. So instead of us, instead of US going into Iraq by themselves, he was the guy who was helping to influence him there to come up with a coalition of willing a yeah. world force to go in there and stuff like that. So an amazing guy, known for his long walks, uh, Keeping his party united. So in politics, very, very difficult to keep your party united. Especially in Australia. Yeah. Especially in Australia. They can be in and then you go to sleep one yeah. day and you've got a new PM. I think I, I think I had three or four, well, maybe more whilst I was there. It was, yeah, um, yeah it's crazy. Yeah. But, you know, it's a, it's a, so, so to me, it's a lot of looking at reading these books there and, and, um, and experiencing uh, and learning through the experiences of others, uh, such as like he's an excellent communicator, uh, never read off a pre, pre-prepared speech. So that, that genuine touch with people. Yeah. And so it was clear, calm, simple, absolutely you know, genuine what he actually did yeah, on that. So, yeah. So they're probably, probably some, some of the main ones from the leadership side of things. I've got lots of others too, sailing ones, gardening ones, but, yeah. Probably yeah. ones which are relevant. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no problem at all. Do you do you know Tishmarsh? Have you seen any of his shows? Alan Tishmarsh. So sorry? Alan Tishmarsh. Have you seen any of his no. shows? Oh, no. yeah, you know, he's yeah. I, I don't watch them, but um, he's always on the TV, or he seems to always be on the TV. So maybe look up that. I'll maybe send you a couple of links. See if you can get any uh, any of his stuff. But he's uh, he's always yeah. on. He, he's a uh, they were sort of a. I'm trying to think of any show similar when I was in Oz, but I don't think there is. But he uh, he does Reynolds and and stuff like that. Just to uh, yeah. it's it is interesting. Like so I do like the before and after photos. Everything in the middle about what plant should go here and all this type of thing is well over my head. But um, the before mm-hmm. and after photos are lovely. Um, so maybe give that a watch. But um, <laughs> we. We've went over a little bit, which is always the case. I always try and keep it to 45 minutes an hour. It never, ever, ever, ever happens. But this has been really, really interesting. And for anyone, obviously, that is listening, who is in Australia, um, we will have Steve doing our senior leadership workshop for us, which really looking forward to. Be good to get, obviously, people that, you know, you don't have to be in a C-suite role to, to come along and see it with Steve. But people that are maybe in that transition phase of 
moving up and trying to transform yourself into being the, the best sort of rounded leader, then Steve will be your man for this if you're moving into the C-suite um, level. Um, and we'll, we'll release some details on that shortly. Um, but Steve, I really appreciate, obviously, you coming on, taking the time out. What's the time now for, for you? Because I know it was a little bit earlier because obviously you're up in Queensland. It's, yeah, it's uh, coming up at 8, 8.30 or so. 8.30. Yeah, it's, it's best light. We get up at 5 in Queensland. Nice Pardon me. Yeah, well, do you know what? It gives too, me too a, hot. <laughs> I, I can get on the phone and get some of these C-suites on the phone now for Queensland, which uh, is always a bonus. But um, much appreciated. I hope, obviously, um, someone, you know, even if it's one person out there has got something out of it, then perfect. That's, that's all I can ask for. But, Steve, really, really do appreciate your time on this one. Much appreciated. And thanks for listening to the podcast, everyone. It's been fun, Jack, and looking forward to catching up with uh, some new trainees at the senior, senior leadership workshops. Much appreciated, Steve. Glad I got you. Tied you down. But uh, yeah, much appreciated. Thanks for listening to the workshop. Hey, the, the, thanks for listening to the workshop. Talk about outtakes there, eh? Thanks for listening to the it's podcast. Been on, eh? I know, I know. <laughs>